Welcome to Recogs, the inventory success podcast where we discuss how the top operators source, manufacture, finance, and sell their inventory in order to create successful businesses. I'm your host, Mike Gell. I'm the community manager here at MFD. MFD is the inventory success platform for consumer and B2B companies. When we say inventory success, we mean that we help SMBs manufacture, finance, and distribute their products across 20 categories. If you're looking for help reducing your COGS, or you're looking for inventory financing help, or to sell in new channels, we're happy to see if we can help at manufacturer.com. Now, I know this is a free podcast, but it doesn't mean I don't have a favor. If you're enjoying this, if you can please subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you're listening to this podcast so you don't miss when the next episode is, that'd be amazing. If you could also leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app, that would be awesome. And we not only produce content devoted to helping SMBs, and hopefully that's educational, but we also love to throw events and help foster community. We throw these coffee events around the country. We also throw happy hours and dinners. To subscribe to these events in order to bring the emerging consumer ecosystem together, check out and sign up at manufacture.com slash events. Thank you, Mark Nathan, for the introduction to our guest today, Michelle Breyer, who is a CMO at SKU. SKU is the consumer products accelerator. Some of their brands include Siete Foods, Dude Wipes, Epic Provisions, Wild Wonder, and Ourobora. Previously, she was the founder of Naturally Curly, which is the largest social media platform for people with textured hair. We discuss the founding story of Naturally Curly, how she scaled, why she sold it after 20 years as well, and also her transition to SKU, some of the differences between beauty personal care products and food and beverage products when it comes to analyzing them, SKU's model overall, and also how she and, and the team and everyone selects brands for each cohort, some of the trends she's interested, particularly in food and beverage, and also trends she might actually be bearish on. It was amazing time, Michelle. This one was actually live in Austin. I forgot to mention that. It was so cool. Thank you to Capital Factory for letting us use your podcast studio to record this. Um, I will be honest, my the video recording is actually not great. Um, I got the wrong angle, unfortunately, for it. So uh, please bear with me on that. But the audio should sound great. Thanks again, John, for always being uh, the best editor in the biz. Without further ado, here's Michelle. Michelle, thanks so much for joining us here. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for coming and visiting us in Austin. What a what a great surprise. Oh my gosh. Well, thanks so much uh, for responding to my email and <laughs> on such short notice and just saying, hey, I'm in town. I know we like meant to hop on a call together, I think a couple weeks ago, and I'm so happy and grateful that we were able to meet um, in person. Yeah, this is well, great. you're the man. You're the, the no, CPG no, no. man. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, well, obviously, you have such an impressive story and such an amazing story. I want to start, first of all, with the company you founded, Na- Naturally Curly. What was the spark? What was the idea that or aha moment that led you to founding the company? Um, you know, you're like lots of good things, uh, lots of ideas. It's your own struggles. And so I grew up in a straight haired world with very crazy curly hair and no idea what to do with it. And there were no products. There were no stylists. Like the world was not kind to people with curly hair. And I um, moved to Texas. Uh, I had my whole routine figured out in California, my hour long straightening and, you know, the whole uh, how I was able to tame it. And you move to Texas. It's a whole different world. And I worked at a daily newspaper with a couple of other curly people and we would complain about our hair all the time and somebody overheard us told us you should start a company for people with curly hair and we had had a lot of uh, mimosas and we at this party got on the computer and naturally Mm -hmm. curly was born Um, really was a hobby in our minds but then it really took off because we were kind of first to market. Nobody else was addressing the market. So we became kind of the the gathering place for, you know, companies who were starting products, hairdressers who were trying to learn how to cut curly hair, and millions of curly people out there who were looking for help. What was that moment like? Because it started off as a hobby for you and 
I guess, never imagined it to be a successful business, right? What what was that turning point? Because I do feel like there's a lot, especially I feel like in CPG, there's a lot of, um, hey, I'm going to start a, start a product, um, see how it goes. And then, oh, gosh, there's some traction here. Maybe we actually can, you know, this is actually a full-time thing. What was that kind of moment for you or series of moments where you felt like, okay, wow, this is actually much more than just a hobby. This is actually something bigger than I thought it would be. Well, I remember um, I had an office phone in my house but attached my fax machine, which is like ancient history. <laughs> and I got a message on it from somebody at Procter & Gamble. And they said, hey, we found your website and we have a new product that we've developed for people with curly hair. And we were wondering if we could advertise. And at that point, our whole revenue model was we sold T-shirts and hats that said naturally curly. Like that was, wow, it was like for, totally for, yeah. a side hustle. No, no big aspirations that it would be anything else. And so I called up and talked to this person and they said, well, we'll pay you this amount a month. And it was a huge amount of money. And it was like, wait a second, like this is much bigger than we thought it could be. And then also we had a company who started using our site to develop a hair care product. And we thought that was so cool. And we wrote about it on our website. Um, and then you couldn't really get that product anywhere. It was a large Canadian company. So they let us start selling it. So we created an e-com site. And the same weekend that we um, bought like $1,000 worth of product, we thought we were crazy. Uh, we got mentioned in the New York Times Sunday style section just out of the blue. And we sold out in 12 hours. Wow. Uh, and like things like that happened where you realized there are a lot of people out there and we have something like really special. So if we can, you know, get and for us, mentorship was the key. How? How did you also think about analyzing products that actually worked versus not? Because certainly in any kind of category, right, there's always products that maybe actually do what they say they're going to do versus some products maybe don't say they're going to do. And you're kind of want to be like a curator, right? Of, oh, yeah. Of, of like a lot of, you know, products want to make sure that that, the, that that these are the right products for you if you have, you know, curly hair, that, 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 that these are kind of best in class. What was your kind of process in terms of, oh my in terms God. of figuring that out? Our sophisticated process was we would go to the store and buy them and we would all try them and we would give them a curl rating of one to five. And, you know, you knew right away. I mean, a curly girl knows right away if a product's going to work, you know, is yeah. it, are you going to walk out the door and is it going to look crazy right away? Is it going to be too crispy or crunchy? I mean, and then we opened it up to our community to give their opinion. And, uh, you know, so it was a really objective viewpoint of all these different products. And at that point, there weren't that many, actually. And we kind of let people up, you know, did a lot of user generated content where they were uploading products and then reviewing them. Um, but to your point, like, most of them do did not work. And I think that's why the opportunities were so big. I mean, I saw that whole kind of indie brand explosion happened in hair care. Uh, it was really those startups, those indie brands started by like solopreneurs, women who had curly hair, who couldn't find products that worked. And they were the ones that changed the market. They were the ones who developed um, product lines that, you know, some of them have since have sold for hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, and they really, to I mean, they were the ones that got the big hair care companies to take the category seriously. You know, because I, a lot of them did not. They're like, oh, we don't have products for curly hair. It's like, oh, you're you're a Unilever brand and you don't have products for curly hair. You know, it just seemed ridiculous that, uh, you know, half the market has some kind of texture. And it was virtually ignored for for so long until these startups started, you know, filling that void. Yeah. And I, well, I, and I imagine, too, probably for the startups, they were probably so grateful uh, uh, that you know, you you had this community. You you actually had like this 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 aggregation of people that actually um, could find products. So you know they, which is always hard, right? Yeah. It, it's yeah. always hard to actually find the people that actually want your products. And so the fact that 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 these is actually kind of a, almost like a launching pad in some ways could be, um, of course, if the products were 
we're we're up to snuff for, uh, we're, we're up to snuff for you so i imagine that 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 must have been pretty pretty cool oh well. yeah no and and a lot of those people became really really close friends i mean a lot of those founders um because we did have this amazing i mean literally millions of people a month were coming there and um you know it really was the democratization of the industry because you didn't have to take out a full ad and a magazine, which is, you know, where the big hair care companies yeah. were advertising. This was very authentic and organic. You know, people were talking about on the site. Um, you know, we had this ability to put them kind of front and center in a really, really highly targeted way. You know, like everybody on our site was there because they were looking for products or hairstylists or just ways to love their hair, you know? I mean, we were really about like, how can we provide you with the tools and inspiration and empowerment to really feel good about yourself? Totally, totally. And what's, again, very dumb question. What's, <laughs> no dumb questions. What's the difference when it comes to products that are maybe made or built for um, for straight hair, for example, versus versus ones that are curly hair? Um, when it comes to like maybe like 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 shampoos or like or like products itself, um, I'd say the ingredients. ingredients okay. um, you know, because some people say, oh, it's just hype. They're just slapping a label on and saying it's for curly or mm -hmm. straight. But a lot of the curly products have a lot more um, moisturizing oils and butters mm -hmm. and you know, and and more natural ingredients. I, I think the curly market really looks for products that or have much more, um, or I'd say a large portion of the market, high quality ingredients. Um, a lot of people don't like to shampoo with like shampoos that have a lot of detergents. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a lot of, um, there are nuances. And I like to joke with my straight haired friends. They may have, you know, they'll have a shampoo in their shower. They may have a conditioner uh, likely probably don't even have a styling product. You open up the cabinet of a curly girl and there's probably dozens of products. And it's not just a conditioner. It's like a leave-in conditioner, a deep conditioner, a daily conditioner, a low poo, a no poo, you know, like every variation that you can think of on any different product type. So, you know, it's it's just completely a whole different world. <laughs> That's a that's amazing. And what, um, and I guess sw switching gears a little bit, you then became after Naturally Curly. Well, talk to me a little bit about like why it was like 2016. Is that right? Where you 2018. 2018. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, talk to me a little bit about about uh, about the acquisition and like and and, and what actually happened um, with Naturally Curly and 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 why you decided to to move on to SKU. Um, I had been with Naturally Curly for 20 years, and we had built it and. Uh, you know, I think right the day before we sold, we put on a huge fashion show during Fashion Week. Um, it was our fourth time doing it called Texture on the Runway. We had, oh, my God, like 800 people, influencers, yeah. paparazzi. And I like I really felt like we had built it into something pretty incredible. And, you know, I'd gotten to be friends with the founder of Shea Moisture like years ago. And he had sold his company to Unilever, and he was acquiring different kind of verticals in the in the category, and had always been, you know, a fan of Naturally Curly. And you know, the timing was right for that acquisition to happen. And for me personally, it was nice to kind of move on and and do something else. Um, you know, I think my identity had been like the curly mm -hmm. the curly person for a long time and I was ready to to kind of so move on. Yeah, no, totally. So talk to me a little about SKU and 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 um and in terms of um, obviously like the nation's first um accelerator for 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 consumer products which is awesome. Um uh, for you was there a learning curve from because you came from uh, uh, from uh, personal care um, to also you know food and bev for example um, and different every different product categories that that SKU also focuses on uh, they all, they don't have um, personal care but was that at all like le, 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 like a hard transition? Um, well, when I came to SKU, I joined as a mentor and SKU 
has had personal care, beauty, wellness brands, and they really, you know, as now being on the other side, I see how we really try to make sure that we have mentors that are knowledgeable in all the categories that yeah. we that we bring companies into. But no, I did not know anything about food and beverage, and uh, yeah, it was uh, initially it was like a whole different world. I mean, the the channels are different, yeah. the uh, just the way that the communities are different. But then there's a lot of things that are the same too, um, in terms of you know the founders and why they came up with the products. It's just like a lot of these hair care brands, it was because they had a need, they had a pain, a pain point, and they're filling that. And then also just the way that these brands, these in, you know startups, really were changing the industry in a lot of different areas, whether it was functional beverages or uh, alternative proteins. Um, so, you know, I'd say initially it was a really steep learning curve to learn about some of the nuances of food and beverage, but now I I love it. I just find it so incredibly exciting. Like you go to Expo West and you're it's just mind blowing to see um, every variation on every kind of beverage and snack. And I mean it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I mean, XOS, I consider that like my Super Bowl. You yeah, know? it's just it's just amazing. You you you, you bump into people that you. Know I love and, it. You yeah. know, it's 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 absolutely just unbelievable. It's, yeah, it's so great. And I I used to go to the big beauty show every year called Cosmoprof, and I felt like I knew a lot of people there, and you'd run into people in the Starbucks, and it was kind of like my family. Yeah. Um, and I feel like Expo West is that now, too. Like, we have so many people in our community that, you know, you'll be walking the floor, you'll run into, you know, dozens of founders and mentors, and it's a very um, close-knit community. No, totally. Um, Talk to me a little bit about, like, SKU's model. Um, So uh, in terms of, like, um, in terms of what type of companies for, for, from a stage perspective that that you're looking for, um, and as well as you know how it actually works from the equity side versus mentorship. So we the the sweet spot for us is about probably two hundred fifty thousand annual sales up to about two million when we're looking at companies to bring in. Uh, but really, it's about you know is this a innovative product? Are they bringing something new to a category? Are they in a hot category, you know, it, it, they have to have some traction in the market. But I'd say the the bottom line is that the founder has to be passionate and dedicated and have a very clear reason why they started that company. Um, you know, it's interesting when you do the finalist interviews and you get a chance to talk to a lot of these people you know, some of the founders just really blow you away. Like they are, you know, you're many times you're betting on the jockey um, as well as the horse, but that jockey is super important. Um, so our model, when a company comes into SKU, they give up a certain amount of equity. Um, there's not a, you know, upfront cost, but obviously equity is very valuable. Yeah. So it's a big consideration for a company um, to take. And that equity is divided up among um, many of our me mentors or equity mentors. Mm. And what that does, so many people have skin in the game. And there's alignment right there. That yeah, for exactly. the company to actually be successful, you know, you actually want the company to be successful because it's not just, you know, you uh, having me mentor sessions, but also, I mean, obviously it is, but also at the same time, you actually do have, as you say, skin in the game. You yeah. And everybody's like marching that. in that same direction, yeah. you know, like the, the liquidity event and all the things that lead to it. Um, you know, the mentors open up their networks and, you know, everybody, I think really goes that extra mile, even beyond the, the 12 week program, be largely because you get so close to these companies and you, you know, our mentors love mentoring. Um, and, but we all want to see these companies succeed. Uh, and not just because we're aiming for a liquidity event, but because we really, you know, become very attached to these founders and their companies. Um, and it's so exciting when you uh, are watching that journey and hopefully you can continue to help them, whether it's, they, you know, 
they need a contact at a retailer or they want to be connected to a potential investor, you know, like long after they go through the program, we're, we're there to help them. That's awesome. That's, that's, that's awesome. Um, and, and so in terms of identifying, identifying these companies and, um, how do you, how do you determine, you know, a, a really great product versus, or analyze a, a product itself versus like the brand itself? Like, do you, could you, could you, could you invest or or, or partner or, or partner with a company or, or have them be part of SKU mentor a uh, uh, part of SKU? If for example you really like the product, you think that 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 what they're building is pretty original, but the branding, for example, is just okay. It's not fantastic, or or vice versa. Well, I think the product has to be amazing. amazing. Okay, you can work on the branding. Yeah, and that's one of the things that happens in SKU. I mean, not every brand needs to rebrand or something like that. But, but if it's... the product isn't good and it doesn't taste good, like you're you're starting off with just a bad foundation. So we, you know, when we're looking at companies to take in to SKU, we right now applications are open for the spring cohort and we'll yeah. get probably a cu- couple hundred. We narrow it down to um, about 40 and we bring in samples and our mentors have a chance to kind of come and taste and look at them. And then we narrow it down again to about 20 to 25 finalists. And we interview and we really dig into kind of, you know, the the, the big questions, you know, their what are their goals? What are their, you know, what is their total addressable market? What, you know, how long have they been in the business? Really trying to get to know them as a as a founder, but that whole, you know, kind of stage before that is so important because you really have to like that product. And, um, yeah, if, if it is not a product that you would buy, (laughs) it doesn't, you can't slap a pretty label on it. Well, how, how do you measure, for example, when you, when you think about, you know, the product has to be great. Is it also that, you have to think it's great, or or could it be also that hey, we're looking at like the sales velocities in the retail stores, and actually they're they're really strong, even even if I don't necessarily like love the product. Well, personally. that and that's important because there are going to you know people have personal tastes, opinions, yeah. and so if it has good traction, that's a sign that they have a market, mm-hmm. and you know like that's why we like to get a bunch of people, uh, you know, their opinion on it. You know, we want a bunch of people to sample it because you know my taste may be different than you know, another SKU team member. Uh, but yeah, if they have traction, if they're doing over a million a year, obviously people like the product. And, and things like dog food, we can't, we're not going to taste the dog food. Um, you know, we do encourage our mentors to take it home to their their pets, but, you know. But that's what's so, that's what's so fascinating about dog food, right? Because really, like, as long as a dog consumes it, right, it can taste whatever it wants, you know, you're not going to get, um, bad reviews on dog food, right? <laughs> so from the pet itself, right? From no. the dog itself. But even, but even like, even, you know, cause we don't know, even like the parents of the pet would leave bad review, bad review. It wouldn't be about the taste of it. You no. know, unless the dog literally is not, uh, consuming it, then maybe you can. And that, that happens. But yeah, th- yeah, yeah no, no, it does. Yeah. So like, that's what's so fascinating that you don't have to deal with taste as much when it no. comes to pet food. You know what I mean? As long as they're consuming the product, then, yeah. then, th- then it's okay. They're not going to put yeah. like two paws down on, like, yeah, on, on exactly. their Amazon review. No, for sure. Yeah. But, 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 but what's interesting, I think about pet is that you then can be actually pretty innovative when it comes to, okay, let's actually create like a real better for your product because you don't actually have to worry as much about taste, which I think is quite, quite Yeah. Well, the pet industry is incredible. And we really had a is. whole track dedicated to pet and we love pet brands. We have a couple that just went through our traditional brands, you know, nice. tracks that have multiple different categories. And a couple of those are doing really, really well. We have a company called Springer Pet, which is a pet water bottles and things like that, um, and a pup above, which has amazing uh, dog foods. But yeah, to your point, like the innovation, the the person buying it is not the person consuming it. So they're buying it based on like wanting, you know, to buy quality things for their pet. And, and you know, it it's a 
it's a whole different dynamic. But, you know, the pet industry, people are spending a lot of money on their pets. Yes. <laughs> more... I mean, there's a stat that I think people spend more money in terms of like making sure that their pet food is better for you and, you know, great or whatever their opinion is of a pet and making it or, or I would say uh, uh, what's the word um, like premium pet food maybe yeah. um, than they are with their kids I mean yeah. which is which is pretty my well I always like to show this Saturday Night Live uh, bit that I don't know I, I I'll send it to you please do please yeah. do and it's yeah. a takeoff on how much people spend on their pets and um there's a, a group of people in the store and they basically shame this woman for not uh, buying the high end pet food. And I, I can't even explain it, but it's incredibly funny. And it really resonates with us because it really is, you know, I think why the industry is where it is, because people, you know, they they will do anything for their pets. Partly, you know, COVID had something to do with that, you know, and totally. more people are having for babies than are having babies. But yeah, and that and that's one of the exciting things about being a part of this industry and being a part of SKU is you get to see these trends. You're like on the cutting edge of these trends. You you you're seeing the products firsthand. You're we have a lot of um, mentors in the pet industry now and as well as others. And so you're just I it's so exciting to kind of be in the middle of it and to see the innovation and to meet these founders that are really changing these categories. No, for sure. How how do you analyze like a trend, for example? And and also if it if like a category, a particular category is like a hot category. Um and do you do you sometimes feel, okay, if this is a hot category, maybe there actually is too much noise in this category and it's going to be much harder to find, you know, the right company here? Um, I guess just how do you how do you think about overall trends or or even like subtrends in, in major categories? Well, it, it's interesting because, you know, the big, you know, the, the reality is there's limited space on shelves, store shelves. Yeah. And if you're going to go in, somebody else is going to probably... Get kicked get out. Le- yeah. So there's got to be an awareness on the part of the retailer. Um, they've got to be either expanding the area or open to be bringing in new types of, you know, products within that category. So it has to be an area of of the store, a category where there is a lot of excitement, where you know that there's going to be sustained growth, not just, you know, some some fad. And then also an awareness that there are more emerging brands being brought in and, you know, it's not dominated by, you know, the big, you know, whether it's Coke or Pepsi, like there's going to be an ability to get on the shelf, you know, so there's, there's lots of different ways that you kind of evaluate it. But, you know, I think our mentors are great at kind of bringing that real world kind of pragmatism to it like okay this is a great product where would it go in the store right right like or how who is it going to get rid of you know what is what is the real um you know who are those people who are really going to buy it are they going to buy it once are they going to buy it again is the price you know going to be something that people are willing to pay you know there's all these little considerations that really play into it um so totally i mean something that i i brought up a a couple of th- a couple of times too, but on willingness to pay and price, I feel like that can be really overlooked sometimes. You know, you could have this incredible product that's you know better for you out the wazoo, and if your pricing though is really that significantly more than your competitors, that's that that's a big deal. It's and it's a huge it's, deal. It's, it's a massive deal, and you know, and I do think that. You know, and I've talked to other investors about this, about how, you know, the dream is investing in brands that can kind of co- cross that chasm, that work, that that maybe start off in the natural channel and can work at a, at a Whole Foods and Erewhon and, you know, a Sprouts, but then can also cross over into conventional groceries. Yes. Right. Yeah. And actually and actually are price at the point where they actually can work in yeah. those in those particular stores and, and, and those accounts. And it's. 
it's really easy to say. It's incredibly hard to do, though. Oh, because yeah. Because well, at the same time as a founder and, you know, in startups, you are you don't have economies of scale. So your margins are going to be a bit weaker um, than, um, than, of course, your margins at scale. Um, uh, so, you know, you, you're going to have to price probably a bit higher than you want to. Um, and so, and at the same time, you know, you're, you're competing against products that are at scale typically, yeah. right? And yeah. also have these deep relationships with these retailers. I mean, it's a real uphill battle for these companies that would, you know, that are, they're trying to gain accounts and, 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 and also from a price perspective. And sometimes I feel like that's a little bit overlooked when it comes to actually what the actual price is for per- for, for a product. That has been a big area that I, I've heard a lot of our mentors uh, working with with brands on. It's like, yeah. yes, your product is is amazing and it's different. It's way too expensive. Yeah. Like you. How are you going to get it down? Exactly. Like you and you don't want them to sacrifice, you know, like if it if it is a premium product, you don't want them to make something that's just dramatically less quality. But there is that happy medium. Um, and I think, you know, that was one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I was sad about Foxtrot. Um, yeah. Because I think everybody that went into a Foxtrot was kind of of the mind that they wanted to try these products. And they may have been a little bit more willing to pay a little bit more because that there were, there were so, you know, it was all about indie brands, you know. But in it, traditional grocery store or even a Whole Foods, you can't be way out of, you know, like you can't be dramatically more expensive. Uh, I mean, it. I don't care what your story is. You know, I mean, I yeah, hate to say that. Yeah, like, no, and, it's true. It's and people true. don't have the time, you know, like you have to assume that everybody you, walking in a store, they don't know your story. No. I mean, I think I am a big believer the story is very, very important. But then, you know, when the average person is pushing their cart through the store, they have no idea. So it has to be high quality and it has to be at least at a price that's not going to be so far out of range. How do you think overall as well about like brand positioning um, in your mind oh, huge. For, <laughs> for, for products? But in terms of like, um, I know, obviously, huge. Uh, <laughs> but in terms of as well, like, from a packaging perspective, and I know that this is a broad question. It's different in every category, but what do you like to see broadly from from packaging in terms of you know how this product may be better for you, or or this product, why you should I guess buy this product? What's what's like unique about this product? Because sometimes I've heard that you almost when you lay out so many things. So many different benefits, then it's almost people confusing. see nothing. Yeah, people see nothing. So how do you how do you think about determining which should be prominent on the actual package versus not? Well, you know that's a huge area where, in fact, our our first and second classes focus so much on that. On that, because you you're really trying to determine what are those key dif- differentiators that are going to get people to purchase it. And there's so many things like non-GMO and, you know, we had an ice cream company. It was like gluten-free. Uh, I can't even go through it. There was probably 30 different attributes and they were all on the carton. And a big part of what the mentors worked on is like, okay, to a retailer who's bringing in the product, they don't know what, like, it's hard. It's confusing for them. It's confusing for the customer. What are those things that really the key things about your product, and it turned out it was really for people who couldn't eat sugar. You know, the other things, you know, may have been important to some people, but there was like two or three attributes were, which were really the the takeaway. And and making those prominent, uh, and that's the thing we see a lot of brands do too. Like that key differentiator may be on the package, but it's, you you have to look hard to find it. So, you know, that can take a lot of hard work to figure out what those are and how to position it. And sometimes people find out uh, by accident or they're just not getting the traction they they want and then realize that, you know, one of the things they haven't been highlighting actually is kind of that, that key feature that's going to make all the difference. Um, I, I wish there was like a magic formula to kind of figure out that what what that is, but I what I do know is you can't have too many things, and you know. 
what's a category that you think you're bearish on or not or not or you don't think at least at this point in time um is 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 maybe strong well the ones when i'm when i'm at expo west and i see basically I'm probably going to get lots of controversy over this but Love things it. like water you know like just water you know water in a pretty can but water um that that always just i i'm like what I, why and yeah. I, um i think there's so many alternative proteins out there in terms of um yeah. meat meat substitutes and i i'm i'm not obviously the only one that's become skeptical skeptical why am I, bearish yeah. <laughs> on just the all of the different things available and the fact that people are much more aware that some of the the products are not healthier than yeah like real meat or real chicken so um i think that that whole kind of uh filtering out in that industry is going to continue um, like i think for a while you could come out with a product and it, it would just you know it, it would explode it would be successful and now it's much more difficult yeah on the plant based meat side i almost on the plant based meat side of things i almost feel sometimes it's um it almost needs like a rebrand of, yeah. of plant based meat because i do think that there's so much skepticism ra- around you know the word process even though everything is pro- yeah. so many things are processed right but 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 like really, p- people say you know oh plant based is just so uh, heavily processed and everything like that and and it's not as good for you as as real meat, which is obviously like debatable. You you, you could take you could deb- debate that into a corner, but um, it is I I but it, it is kind of interesting. I do wonder sometimes like what is it the, the the target consumer for it? Because with Beyond Meat and with um and with Impossible, you know they they wanted to be in the meat aisle and they yeah. were in the meat aisle. You know, so it was you know you're trying to get meat eaters to you know maybe not convert fully but you know have but introduce the idea of plant based meat and an option into their diet right but it is interesting i do think there's a lot of interesting startups that are coming up that are that are plant based meat but there almost there almost is like a um at least maybe in like maybe meat eaters i'm a, i'm a meat eater um uh but almost like a uh, like a bad, almost like needs like a rebrand almost yeah. of the entire category just because you're, just because of what kind of happened before, yeah. you know, and 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 what you know your kind of overall view is of plant based. I don't know if you agree, but yeah, yeah. Well, and I know like we have a company uh, that went through called Noble Burger, and they're kind of this, I think, a part of a growing category. They're not trying to be me. Yeah, like they are a. a veggie burger made with real veggies like actual veggies yeah 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 and there's a i think a lot of people that's what they want they yeah they want something that is like kind of trying to replicate yes. something else right. that experience it's something that's just delicious on its own right but it tastes it doesn't taste like meat yes yeah. exactly so i'm i am seeing that kind of grow yeah um in terms of other ones i'm bearish on it, that's tough to say because I, like I'm in my mind, I'm I'm traveling back to um, Expo West in March and walking uh, like the B Hall and looking <laughs> up and down the aisles and trying to think of the things that I just kind of didn't wasn't excited about. But yeah, I mean, well, it's kind of we, we kind of went through that 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 one theme, right? I, I, I say a couple of years ago at Expo West when it was like plant based everything and everything yeah. was. I think there was like a tea company and it said plant based on it. Yeah, so it was just kind of like. Everywhere on the, on the on the plant based side, and um, you know, I mean, one thing that I'm very curious on is, you know, the non elk market. Um, I think that's a really interesting trend. Oh yeah, n- non elk, yeah. but also like the non elk. Um, it's not alcohol, but it's but um, for example, like CBD or um, infused or even THC infused. Yeah. You know, and something that I've been thinking about is of the non alks what would be the bigger category? Will it be straight non-alks or would it be something that you actually still want? Like a functional beverage? Like a functional beverage, yeah. Like Or like a like a THC infused or CBD infused product. Like would that, which one would kind of win out of, of, of those as an alternative to alcohol? So I, well, I think they do such completely d- different d- things. Different things, okay. Yeah, okay, like, yeah. A, like a tea, 
THC, it's you're you're still wanting a buzz. You're still wanting a buzz. No, exactly, exactly, exactly. And yeah, with um, you know, a, a true non-alc, no alcohol, no anything. It's it's that you want the taste of a cocktail. Yeah. But you don't want anything. But you don't want anything. Yeah. You don't want, yeah. yeah. You don't want your mind to be altered. Yeah. But we're seeing, you know, definitely growth in that category. And I just heard a CNN report yesterday morning about how um, there's, well, there are now our entire stores that just focus on non- non-alc or, you know, liquor stores that have whole sections. And, you know, like Target has a whole section now that's just for non-alc. And so I think. Yeah. I, I totally. see it continuing to grow. Um I mean, I'm a little biased because we have some incredibly exciting brands that have gone through SKU in that category, and um, they're seeing really, really, you know, good growth. Yeah, actually, one of, one of the companies we work with that manufactured actually, um, they actually led that Target launch like nationally. Oh, great! Uh, Shishé. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So yeah, no, it was um, yeah, but um, so. Uh, I definitely seen like you know tremendous growth in the category. It's so cool that Target also you know um, also has like their own like non alcohol section as well. Yeah, it's such a such a huge signal as well to um, uh, to the rest of retailers. Yeah, too. and I think what's really exciting is not just people who are not drinking any alcohol who are buying it. It's people who may not want to drink as much, or they're you know when they're training for an athletic event or something, they want to kind of not maybe maybe take down their alcohol in- intake but i think that category has you know has a, a lot, lot of, legs. of legs yeah i was going to say about cbd in terms of categories i'm bearish on bearish on yes. okay okay <laughs> well just cuz it's so oversaturated and what is it even it seems to have found its way into everything including things like hair products yeah. it's like what is the, even the efficacy here like yes. what like what is it actually doing um for any product it's in i mean can you you know, even in a beverage, are you, you know, what what exactly is that benefit that it's offering? And it it can be all over the map depending on how much is in it. And I don't know. That is actually really interesting that, you know, for that product, as you say, it's really in a lot of, it, it's in a lot of other products. It's in yeah. personal care. It's in beauty. Yeah. It's, in, it's in a lot of other things yeah. Yeah. too. Um, uh, uh, that actually, that certainly helps um, the body. But that's, yeah, it's, it, but will it be actually oversaturated? That's a really good point in terms of in, in terms of in too many different product categories that people are like ah yeah CBD, I you know I have I I can find it in in, in other forms. Why do we need to yeah. to, to consume it? Yeah, cool. um, but yeah, I I think it's um, you know it's hard to break through in that category now because it's just everywhere. Everywhere, yeah, yeah, cool. But that but that I would say. Uh, that's probably true of a lot of categories. You know, I I think that you have to really be bringing something special, unique, give people a reason, like, to pay attention to you in, in any category. I mean, I, that's not profound or, you know, rocket science, but, I mean, I, I, you know, we really, really instill in our founders, you know, make it easy for people to figure out what your product is, um, make it, you know, why they should try it, um, because there's a lot of competition out there. Totally, totally, 100%. 100%. But there's also opportunity. I mean, I use the example of dude wipes. I mean, who would have thought that? I love them. I I love them, too. I love them. I absolutely love them. They're great. Yeah. They're great. And um, amazing opportunity, amazing brand. Yeah. Incredible brand. And who would have thought, like, in the personal wipe category there would be room for and and they're they're crushing it absolutely crushing it oh my gosh i had i've interviewed sean and i've also interviewed greg and it's also really amazing how they built their team i mean they've only raised two hundred fifty thousand outside capital yeah uh, outside capital that's it yeah and they're built i think they're set to do like 180 million this year and they their team is like 30. I know. It's like unbelievable. And he, and they so lean and just like just and it's amazing. viral marketing. I mean like yeah. and and Sean is this kind of genius when it like well yeah and they also what I think that also is really interesting about their story is if you think about if you go to their website you can't I'm pretty sure you can't buy Dubai's directly from them. You'll be resorted to Walmart 
Amazon, one of their third party. And I think it's really cool because what they were telling me was that they really value their retail partners and retail relationships. When they did, for example, when they sponsored NASCAR, they put dude wipes, but you can buy it at Walmart, like on the actual logo. They didn't need to do that, yeah. right? And Walmart was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Walmart didn't ask for them at all to do that. But I just think that also really creatively, and I feel like they're a really, really interesting case study on how to actually collaborate with your wholesale buyers to drive volume, I think that they've done an amazing job. Yeah, and, and retailers want to work with brands Yeah, like that. 100%, yeah. 100%. I just think it's really interesting because in terms of marketing, it's like viral D to C, you know what I mean? Like yeah. online. But it's interesting how you actually can't buy their product D to C. It's all, I mean, I think that, I mean, TikTok shop, I guess, is D2C, but, um, and I know they do a TikTok shop, but it's all like stream. Like they're, they're trying to push all their product out to, you know, um, wholesale, which yeah. I think is really, really interesting. Yeah. I, I have to give Sean props because, you know, he's a SKU alum and he is so good about talking to new founders and just being so generous with his time and providing, you know, Providing advice that's and awesome. I love I love that. Oh my gosh, I had no idea Dubai was also a school alum. That's awesome. That's awesome. Cool. Um, well, Michelle, this was such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time. I feel like honestly we could have chatted for another hour. Well, uh, me too. So yeah, but <laughs> thank you so much. I gotta catch a flight, but yeah. thank you so much for your time. <laughs> if I didn't have to catch a flight, I would definitely be be going for another uh, thirty minutes or 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 as long as you'd have me. So yeah, but t- well, thank this you was so much. Fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. And there you have it. It was so great time with Michelle. Michelle, really appreciate you opening up and tell us, tell us a bit more about SKU as well as how you think of the world of CPG. It's it's certainly also an area that's very, very deep, deeply passionate with, with me that I certainly care about as well a lot. And uh, check out SKU. Check out the Accelerator if you're a brand in that 250K to, to $2 million range when it comes to revenue. Um, although I know that they have accepted brands that are smaller than that. Uh, and as well, check out our events, manufacturer.com slash events to sign up for them. We produce events around the country, helping to bring the emerging consumer ecosystem together. Thanks again for listening.